Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode two of the Planeswalker podcast. I'm your host, Seth Manfield, and I'm joined by my co-hosts, of course, uh, Jason Florin and Danny T. Law. Welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. So I remember last week we were talking about the Omnath deck in Standard, and I'm just going to go ahead and say it. I was... I thought it was going to get banned. Uh, something was going to get banned from the deck, rather. Uh, but there was some some people that thought the format was pretty healthy. So, uh, Jason, do you want to go ahead and... Uh... Okay, all right. Yeah, you me right of the bus. Again, so that's great. Um, okay, look, it might have been. So we recorded the podcast on Tuesday. By Thursday, I was like, oops, okay, I made a mistake here. Um, yeah, well, Omnath was definitely, like, the deck was too busted um and now we've seen uro exit which a lot of people are not happy about we'll touch on that a little bit later um i will say though i was having success with gruel adventures and gruel adventures apparently had the best weekend <clears throat> out of any archetype last weekend have the highest win percentage um but i was looking at the stats today and the sample size was like a little bit small it was like 128 matches which at first i was like oh that seems like a decent amount but when you think about it like 100 matches each match is like one percentage so like eh, it's like where's the error there right like if it's off by like three matches all of a sudden the win percentage goes from like 54 percent to like 51 percent um or even lower so yeah okay i'm fine i'll i'll take this beating i was wrong okay i was wrong all right so that's one that's one tick on the scoreboard uh for me and, <laughs> <laughs> no just kidding I'll, I'll just keep i'll just keep that one in my head and i'll use it against you uh, in the future, just just to remind you. But let's go ahead and talk about the ban. And I want to kind of get your reactions, Danny and Jason, about whether or not you actually thought the. And of course, I'm sure everyone already knows, but Uro uh, was the card that was banned in Standard. And I want to kind of hear about what you all think about the choice to ban specifically Uro. <clears throat> sure. Um, so I think everyone kind of guessed it was Uro. It was more of a question, will it be only Uro or will it be more, right? Um, Uro was not the card that was actually the problem in the Omnath deck. I mean, Uro was played in Omnath and in Sultai, and Sultai was actually the best deck against Omnath, but that's not playable anymore since Uro is banned, right? So the main question is, does it hurt Omnath more or, Sul or like the Sultai deck? Um, in my opinion, uh, Uro is a really strong card, like a really, really strong card. Um, but there are just cards in the in the current format and standard that are way better. If you go down to Pioneer, for example, you see like Reclamation with Omnath. You see like, I think it's even modern now, like Omnath is a really, really strong card. Um, we all kind of felt they cannot ban Omnath, but at least they maybe could tackle another card in the deck, maybe like Escape to the Wild, so... Genesis ultimatum, like a payoff spell, but it was just Uro. So I was a bit shocked, to be honest. Um, I cannot say I did not expect it, but yeah, it is what it is now. Yeah, I kind of wanted to see like maybe Escape the Wilds go also, because my feeling was that Teamer Adventures might become too overpowered. Um, from these first days, though, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go on a limb here. I'm gonna say that Uro banning did more than people think it did. Everyone seems to think it didn't do enough because there's all these Uro uh, Omnath decks with like crab in them and stuff. Um, at least I'm calling my shots. All right, I'm putting it out there. Um, <laughs> Already happy for next week. <laughs> scoreboard. Um, yeah. So Omnath is still king. I think it's still the best deck. And like you were saying, Danny, like the the card is just so busted that it's one of those cards that like, you know, kind of like Fires of Invention, where even if, you know, when Fires first came out, it was good. And then it went on to another set got added and it was good. And then like things kept getting added until it was just like, oh, okay, we can't deny this anymore. And Omnath kind of feels like that too, where it's like, you know, if you take away all the role players, okay, you can weaken it, but just like new cards will come in with new sets and eventually like, oh yeah, getting four extra mana and gaining four life and dealing your opponent four damage is just is just too freaking good. Um, so it seems like it's really just a matter of time until they have to ban it. I will say though, the Uro ban has done a lot more than I thought it was going to. 
The Rogues deck um, had an okay Omnath matchup, but it was just Uro was such a beating. You'd mill it into their graveyard. They'd be able to bring it back out really quickly, and it would shut off all your Rogues because they'd be exiling their graveyard. Now that that's gone, um, I've been having a lot of su success with the Rogue deck. Uh, and I think that, you know, if at least one deck, if at least one deck, whatever it is, blue-black control, blue-white control, Rogues, if one of these decks can get a winning percentage against Omnath, they can actually, you know, farm Omnath. Well, then that starts the rotation of the format, right? If one deck can get a leg up, um, then you can start to see things start to move around and around. And I think we might actually start to see that now. Yeah, I might have to agree with you, but I do think my initial reaction was this is kind of a cop-out ban. Like, if you're going to ban something make um you know like ban multiple cards or ban like a, the key card like the key card in that deck in my opinion is omnath so um and uro is just kind of this generically good card that's been hanging around in the format for so long everyone knows about how good uro is like it's always if it's legal and standard it's always going to see play it's been it's just one of those cards where it's like okay you're just taking away one of the most powerful cards in the format but i don't know that you're specifically like it's it it basically what it did going back to what danny was saying is it basically just crushed out the salt eye deck that's the first thing it did like i haven't seen a single p person playing salt eye with uro gone uh, whereas before it was like one of the more popular decks so um yeah i think that there was also some omnath builds that were not playing that many Uros, whether that be right or wrong We've seen this past weekend decks with what one Uro, two Uros doing well. So you can play like Cultivate in that slot. You can play Beanstalk Giants. You can play other other cards that are. You can argue whether they're better or worse than Uro. I'd argue that the fact that Uro is gone from the list completely does make the grindy game plan a little bit worse. Like the ability of just going long and then having this reoccurring threat. And I think that is kind of the element that is going to end up holding the Omnath back, Omnath deck back a little bit because you don't have this late game inevitability if you just have a bunch of these too many ramp cards. You can get to a point where you just have too much ramp and you have what? You have Omnath, but you have to have other, you have the white enchantment, right? That makes a bunch of uh, two twos with landfall but there's not that many actual payoff cards now without the euros so i think that's going to be the challenge of seeing kind of where the deck goes from here um so initially yeah i think i was skeptical about the ban but now we're what at least a day removed from it and i've of course because i'm preparing for the grand finals i've just been playing the whole day playing the metagame challenges and, and etc trying to beat it and I guess I'm starting to come more to the realization that it hurt the deck a little bit, but that it, that little bit might be enough to let some of these other decks really um, get their footing, like Rogues, as you already mentioned, Jason. So, yeah, I'm excited. I'm actually not confident in just taking the stance that Omnath is going to dominate this format yet. It still could, but I'm not ready to, to say that. Yeah, uh, I think so too. And I want to go back to something that Jason said, the rotation of the meta right now. If you just take Uro, right? What what decks did keep Uro in check? Um, classic control decks usually had a problem against Uro. If the, if the control deck played Uro itself, that deck usually was in favor, right? So classic control decks, maybe like Esper or Blue White or even Demir now, uh, have a better shot because Uro is gone. And then on the other hand, they don't have Uro and Omnath for the life gain. So every strategy like Gruel Adventures or like other aggro decks also have a better spot. So it's definitely easier to tackle them. And I also faced uh, Gruel Adventure, Rogues today, uh, Blue White Control. I saw more of, the, of those decks again. Um, right now, I think the Omnath Adventure deck seemed strong to me. I'm not too sure. I know, Chase, you like the traditional one more. And I think that one is still really strong. 
But yeah, I think uh, with Uro gone, auto decks definitely have a better shot at it. Yeah, that's a really good point about the uh, incremental life gain because Uro gained a lot of life, right? It's like three when it comes in, three when it comes back the, from the graveyard, and then the Omnath decks. Like, have you ever played old, like the old pre pre ban Omnath? And they would just like they'd have an Uro in play, and before they even attack, they like escape an Uro like two more times just to like draw extra cards, and then they would attack. It like it would gain so much extra life. And uh, it was hard to deal with. Whereas, like, Omnath, there are some cards in the format, like uh, Red Cat Melee, Mystical Dispute. These are, like, one-mana answers. So you can kill an Omnath um, and stop it from gaining so much incremental life. So I think that's uh, a really important um, key that you hit on there, Danny. I've been seeing people start to main deck Red Cat Melees or main deck these... Like, main deck whatever removal you have, make sure it can kill an Omnath. Like, I'm playing... Like, for me, I'm playing now in my black decks, I'm playing four Heartless Axe and zero Eliminates because I, I just want to make sure my car, my card kills kills an Omnath uh, or like a Cobra. And like stopping the turn two Cobra or stopping the Omnath early can really set back um, that deck. Yeah, for sure. Uh, have you guys actually played the, uh, the Omnath, the new Omnath lists? So you're talking about some of the lists that didn't run Uro. One of them uh, ran Ruinous Crab. And I thought that was kind of like, I don't know, sort of a joke or like kind of a meme or something. I was like, how is this actually a card? And what I found was that it's actually ridiculously good against the Teamer Adventures list. I've had such a hard time dealing with Ruinous Crab out of that deck just because if they... You know, if they ultimatum into them, it's so many cards. If they ever just get two out, it's just so many cards. And there's nothing really in the format that lets you shuffle your graveyard back in your library outside of, like, uh, Midnight Clock, which takes quite a while to get going. But there's not one of those standard, like, guys blessing type cards or anything, which um, may be very sad because I had no wish targets to kind of get myself back into those games. What do you guys think of – have you actually played those, Om those new Omnath lists? I didn't ever play it, but I think uh, the middle strategy in general is there, also with the rogue, right? So I could see people picking up Croxa. That's something I can see, but yeah. Yeah, there's not. I think milling is coming back a bit more because the Titans, because one of the big Titans got hit. And like you're saying, Croxa, if people are trying to mill you, even with just like, it doesn't have to be your whole deck, but even if it's just rogues, which is trying to mill you. Then just having a titan like just milling a croxa is is insane for you um or even polychronos which we haven't seen that much but like those types of cards i do think um definitely are going to be more valuable anything with escape um is has gone up in value if people start are starting to play crabs if people are starting to play rogues i've played a bit with i've dabbled with the crab um already I think that Crab, as you're saying, Jason, is specifically targeting these teamer-based decks because th those decks don't actually play that much removal. Like, you, there's not th there's there's the what the thundering rebuke is that what it's called the two mana four damage, um, but like some people play like a couple of those, but there's not really and there's, there's the spike field hazard, which is the land that deals one damage, right? But um, yeah, there's just not that much removal in those decks. So, like, a cheap threat that actually can snowball and win the game where against a strategy where, like, with the Omnath deck, you actually have to go through a lot of your deck. So, like, you have to be escaping the wilds. That's five cards. You have to be ultimatuming. That's another five cards. You have to be fable passaging, searching, digging out cards. So you're digging so many cards that now even so now you're you're milling a deck that is maybe half of where like you're always you're starting at half the the starting size so like if you get two crabs and normally you do need i would say you need two crabs in play to really uh get the job done i've seen it with one but more often it's like play a crab and then these lists also are playing the land that clones a creature a lot that's of the right. time. So you can, and that's like, so you can clone an Omnath, right? Or you can clone, um, 
more often you're cloning your crab. So you're just kind of going on that plan. And with so much, so much digging, it's actually a pretty fast clock. So I've seen it. Uh, but the problem is, is you also have to devote cards to it. Like if you're playing four crabs in the main deck, then there's X amount of cards you're not playing. And then if you get paired against, say, Gruul or whatever, where the O3 body isn't necessarily doing anything and there's no realistic way that you're going to mill them out, then all of a sudden it's not a good card, right? Like, so, um, because you're not a dedicated mill deck, you're still an Omnath deck that just happens to play crab. So it's like a, it's like a metagame call where your target and and clover is the same way right like you can get a i think that the way i would i haven't played that against that specific matchup that much but i assume that you get a clover out and if you get a clover out because there's not that many answers to clover which i do think that people are going to start to play um more artifact removal whatever artifact removal there is whether it's shield breaker whether it's the the disenchant green cycle uh, wilt, whether it's wilt. But in any case, I think people are going to play those cards. But if you get a clover out, clover still should trump crab, right? Like if you have a bone crusher and a clover or something, you can just kill a crab that way. So I don't know. It seems interesting, but um, I also think that it may just be people trying new things mm. out right now, which everyone is kind of experimenting. And until we get like right now, if you go on the ladder, I'm, I'm very confident in the deck you will play against the most is going to be Omnath. But then the second most played deck, I would say, actually is Clover at this point, which has been... Um, and then maybe Rogues is third, something like that for me. So um, has that been your guys' experience? Yeah, it's the same for me. There's actually one card I just want to throw in here if Mill becomes uh, a viable strategy, and that's Dance in Demands. I played Rogues today, and the <laughs> only game I lost, the only game I lost was against Dance in the Mans. I was completely shocked, because when they fire this off and you don't have a counter, and there's two, two, Doom, for, uh, two Doom Portals and other enchantments <laughs> coming in, it's not fun. It's not fun. I didn't think about that, but I saw it today, and it was pretty powerful. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. I've um, also run into a surprising amount of Clover, which is normally a deck that you don't see a whole lot of, just because... I don't know, it's kind of difficult to play. Um, it tends not to be as popular as some other decks. Um, but yeah, we're seeing this whole thing where multiple decks now are milling their opponents, and then, like, even to, like, death. The Rogues deck doesn't really, like, typically mill you out, but uh, it can. Um, but it's important, like, you know, their whole deck is predicated on having at least eight cards in their opponent's graveyard to turn on a lot of their creatures. Um, and then also some amount of cards for um, Drown in the Depths. Um, and then there's also, like we were mentioning, the uh, the Runus Crabs out of the um, Omnath lists. And so now we're seeing also, though, the so people are now responding to this by doing things like playing Dance in the Mans, playing Proxa, and then also just playing like escape cards that you normally wouldn't see people play. So like Mono Green is playing the, uh, the one mana Spider that, like when it comes back, I think it like deals damage or fights with a, a flying creature. Yeah, the chain to Ratner, mm -hmm. I've seen that. I, I was looking for Crawl Harpooner. I was like, where is Crawl Harpooner gone? But no, that, that card is <laughs> I, I was just reminiscing about how good that would be in this in this format. It would be like so so absurd against the rogue stack. But chain to Ratner is a pretty sad harpooner, but I've been I've been jamming like in some of these decks, I've been messing around with cards like Vantress Gargoyle um cards like cheap fl cheap flyer cheap flying creatures plummet i mean plummet is like okay i'm gonna kill your 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 nighthawk guy or your rankle or like whatever it may be so i mean there's not that much good removal just finding good removal spells out of certain colors against the rogue deck has been a challenge um so you got to kind of make do with what you have <laughs> Yeah, I think it also depends on the rogue list. There are rogue lists that run like eight counters if you call if you count drowning the lock as well. And so even a card like Gargaroth, who is actually really, really strong, um, has problems because it can get destroyed or countered really easy. Yeah, Gargaroth, I don't like it. Like I see it because people a lot of lists are playing Gargaroth because you know of how powerful of card it is, and it is, but 
you don't want to play Kargaroth in a format where there's a lot of cheap answers to it because if you do tap five mana and put that Elder Gargaroth down and then it gets answered, answered by something like a Heartless Act or even just a bounce from a Brazen Borrower hmm. or even maybe it just gets countered by a Lofty Denial, these are two mana cards, right? Hmm. Like, or Drown in the Lock or whatever. Like, I'm just naming so many cards that deal with it. It's actually hmm. just not a good card against Rogues, I don't think, because you're just going all in by playing it. Like, you play it and it's most likely going to get answered. Like, in in your best case scenario, you're trading with the Nighthawk Flyer and then like getting a little bit like getting a trigger, but even that is not that exciting to me. So I I I'm steering clear of, of Nighthawk and I want more cheap things like Scorching Dragon Fires, that type of card. <clears throat> yeah, so like even as we're talking about now with like uh Omnath builds maybe doing mill, maybe not doing mill, I feel like even that's starting to stir the pot of like the meta game because now like you know if you're a deck that is reacting to that like for instance i had a really hard time beating uh runa's crab with um teamer adventures but if they weren't playing runa's crab i think the matchup is actually significantly easier um and the same sort of like you know if you're playing an aggro deck well you don't really care about runa's crab and so it's like now all of a sudden you're starting to see like how do you build your omnath deck do you build it to target Teamer Adventure is another teamer slow list, or do you target the the more aggressive lists? Um, and then I'm also just convinced that Rogues has a good Omnath and a good uh, good enough teamer Adventures list, which was that was like the big eye opener for me. I assumed that teamer Adventures would kind of crush um, a Rogues list because that's just sort of what it does. It just beats up on you know I don't know creature lists, right? Um, but like the Rogues list being really cheap. And also kind of punching above its weight class, like having like a one mana three two flash um, kind of creature, or um, any of the rogues that come in uh, that kind of plump each other up. It's just it's hard for the adventures list to deal with everything at instant speed. It's kind of like a little bit more of a sorcery based list. Like yeah, it's got some stomps, uh, but it's only got four. And then after that, you have brazen borer, which like okay, petty theft doesn't do a whole lot, just bouncing it back to their hand. And then after that, you're kind of just tapping out on your own turn uh, a whole lot. Yeah, I think Rogues is a deck that people write off for whatever reason. I think because it's called Rogues or because it plays like flyers that look or like cards that look underpowered, but don't write it off before trying it. That's my advice. Like it is actually a real, real deck to the point that I think it's tier one. Um, it's a tier one strategy. And I shouldn't, I, I just think, I, th I just think it is. I think it's a really good deck. Um, and it's really interesting to me how you can play, how many different shades of these blue decks, like all of these decks are blue, but like you've got blue, black aggro, at like aggro tempo, sure. But it's also kind of refreshing because we haven't seen anything like that. I can't remember the last time we had an aggressive uh demir deck so that's pretty sweet yeah a long time yeah i think it's like anything that's ever tribal like goblins or elves or now rogues it just always seems like you know kind of like like a like a kitty deck or something it looks like you know because people are like i'll make my angels deck or i'll make my uh you know my vampires deck and like it has that kind of thing to it but then it's like oh yeah so i'll make my life gain deck exa exactly Whatever. Dragons. Like, <laughs> you know exactly right dragons but or like I'll make my mill deck in this format, but it's like, <laughs> wait a second, like I know that these aren't just memes; these are actual mm. decks. Like <laughs> this is not we. This is not a joke. <laughs> we, you have this is the standard format you are entering into. Yeah. Well, sometimes <laughs> the synergies are just very, very powerful, right? Like uh, I mean, we've seen what goblins has done in historic. I mean, elves won a, a pro tour. Um, sometimes, sometimes it's just uh, it's just over the top. Yeah, and I think that as far as Clover goes, I the jury's still out for me on whether you want to play Omnath or not because I've definitely seen, like, I think maybe even more Omnath versions out there than just the straight-up teamer. You get Giant Killer, which is a nice addition because it, it's just an adventure creature that happens to kill Omnath, right? And then you maybe cut some of your Lovestruck Beast because Lovestruck Beast 
doesn't do that much against rogues. So like if rogues is a top deck, then like you're like, you know, your ground creature plan may not be the best. So I don't know. It's, it's interesting to me to see the four color, the, the different, like as you add more colors to your deck, you get more options. And that's kind of, I like that. I've also seen lists play straight teamer, but add a bunch of like four copies of the spike field hazard. Right. So that's a card that is, has really, really been going up for me. Like to the point that now if I'm like a two or three color red deck, I, I certainly want to be playing them. And I would be surprised if I'm not playing like at least three in my deck because it kills Cobra it gets rid of all of the a lot of these rogues. Uh, it's a LAN. So there's very few matchups. It gets rid of Edgewell Innkeeper. So it's just a great card in terms of being a cheap removal spell that's also a land. So it's got the that functionality to it. So that's been one of my one of the cards that I've I know a lot of people are already playing it, but it's also been very impressive for me. Yeah, I want I want to chime I- in on that deck a little bit. Um because like obviously I've played a lot of uh adventures. Um, and everyone's really high on it right now. Everyone's like, like you know, on the CFB uh, rankings. I think LSV had it as, as his number one list. People were talking about it. I, I'm going to go out on the record again on this one. Uh, I don't like it. I think it's a worse version of both of their decks. I'll say it probably depends on what the metagame looks like. But hear me out on this. So first, um, uh, Adventures struggles against Omnath decks, right? It's kind of a tough matchup. Do you think adding a fourth color and Omnath makes that matchup any better? I don't think so. I think it, I think, uh, okay, hold on, hold on. Let me, let me get my skill out. In the day <laughs> um, I don't think it makes, I don't think it makes that matchup better. Um, and then also in the mirror, having just an Omnath, like don't care. Uh, I don't like, you can have all the, you can have all the Omnaths you want all day long, gain all the life you want. I'm just going to quote that having just an Omnath don't care. <laughs> <laughs> That's gonna be the piece. That's gonna oh, be the love for this. This should be a weekly thing, now. Put that, that this has to be a weekly Twitter. thing. Where you do a statement. <laughs> okay, but it's true though. But it's true though. In a teamer adventures, like imagine you're playing teamer adventures, and your opponent has a four four, and they just get to gain four life every turn. Like that, you don't care about that, right? They can gain four life every turn. Every it doesn't matter. You're gonna you're gonna overwhelm them with card advantage and deal some ridiculous amount of damage to them later on with a huge beanstalk with like an ember cleave on it or something. So it, it gains life. All right, let's imagine there's a clover also in play, and now that and now they're using the extra mana to go ahead and fey of wishes. I just want to say, okay, okay. Times. So this is, this is the thing though. It happened to you, me. It's so now, okay. So now you're you're both playing clover though right like so you have clover um you know if they're able to just like snowball off like a lot of times the matchup does come to one person sort of not necessarily snowballing off in one direction like uh the matchup's like quite complex and sure i could see some scenarios where omnath could be helpful um in general though it's it's not what the deck is looking to do. You know, it's, it's kind of just like jammed in there awkwardly into the game plan. Um, also, you can kill an Omnath relatively easy. Uh, the deck can answer Omnath pretty well. So like when I'm playing Team of Adventures against an Omnath list, I don't even care about Omnath that much. Don't get me wrong, card's good. Let's, you know, for, let's be real. But it's the Genesis Ultimatum that typically kills you. If, if Omnath did not have Genesis Ultimatum, and I don't know, say that uh, you could, you know, maybe ban Escape to the Wilds, like that matchup becomes like really good um, because it's it's quite hard to actually kill the team or adventures player. So for instance, like a current Omnath list plays for what, what are their threats? They'll have Omnath. They'll have technically they'll have Cobra. Uh, currently, they'll have Crab and um, some will have like maybe a Kenrith or something. It's actually quite hard to kill a team or adventures player if you're not going to mill them out with a crap. Because like try to get through a bunch of ground creatures and try to deal them a bunch of damage when they have all kinds of answers, it's really tough. And so 
I mean, okay, I'll wrap this up because I've been stealing for forever. I think Omnath Adventures. I'm gonna Ugin. I'm gonna Ugin, and I'm gonna wipe your board. <laughs> <laughs> I think Omnath Adventures is, the worst, of of is the worst version I'm of both. I think the worst version of both. I'm gonna Terra Peaks, and then I'm gonna Beastar Giant, and I'm doing. 20. I think. I think. I think play Teamer Adventures or play Omnath. I think them together is. I think you're fooling yourself into thinking that you have a better deck. That's where I'm at. I want to say something to this. Um. In the mirror, maybe the Timur, let's say Timur Adventures against Omnath Adventure. Maybe Timur Adventure is in the Adventures because the, the line they have is better. But that giant killer with two clovers on a on a board state that is just stale, which happens a lot in those games sometimes. If both just go off and just play all the creatures, 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 and then someone's just I kill this, I kill this, I kill this, I kill this, is pretty good. Also, in the sideboard, you get another color now. So I'm not sure which card you could add there, but I saw a list with uh, ECD. I'm not, not a big fan of this, but you can also use Intervention, the white one. And I think the Clover list doesn't like that too much in a Clover mirror, right? Um, I saw many, many sideboard cards and they look interesting. Just adding a color, it's not just about Omnath. Omnath is great. It works great against the Agro decks. And I played against it and I do four damage each turn with my Flyer. They put in a land. It, it's not fun, right? And if they have a beanstalk child, they do four damage to you, and they just fade into something and something, and it's it's not that bad. I think in the mirror, maybe I can see it's still okay for the team list, but I think with a good sideboard plan on white, you can improve. Okay, that. So okay. Let, let let me say something here. I don't know for sure which version is better. Okay, I understand both arguments, but I will say that my argument why I think that Omnath version may be better is. By adding the fourth color, it's n not that hard to add the fourth color to the deck. And I ar I'd argue that because you have Omnath, it like it it offsets so much to the that so that the aggro matchups now are better. Even though you why have do you need a better aggro matchup? Teamer Adventures crushes aggro. That's what the well, deck it, does. Well, it crushes it even more. Well, you just it's really got it. Just even really better got than it was before. <laughs> okay, <laughs> <laughs> all right. And then the other thing is that I don't think that the there's that big of a downside basically like you're 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 not cutting that many cards like i don't know that the love struck beasts are even that good in the deck right now anyways so like you're adding some like you're adding six cards to the deck and so well i mean the list is so tight that it's hard to fit any any cards in there so this here this is probably the most important thing do you think it's better against a normal omnath deck do you think adding a four four for four that draws you a card and like you like gains you some life is going to help you in what your toughest most popular matchup is normal omnath um i want to say there's something let's say you have the omnath right turn two you have clover turn four you have omnath and you still have your beanstalk giant on your hand with a fey so if you get to untap there that turn is going to be really huge really really huge i think you can cripple the omnath deck there also the giant killer seems to me pretty good and being able to have the extra four mana which is pretty easy to get with either a fable passage or a beanstalk giant and then using that mana to be able to fey i think is pretty important because the fey is such a mana intensive card that if you're able to basically just fey off the free mana from omnath then you are now passing the turn with like counter spells for their ultimatum Wow, right. you know what, guys? I did not think of that. You have really turned me around here. Why are you laughing? Why are you, why are you laughing? That really did why, 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 why are you laughing? No, I'm very convinced. But hear me out. So, what if you look at this? I don't know. This is kind of crazy, though. But, like, what if you go, like, turn two Cobra? And then you go, like, I don't know. Like, let's be crazy here. Turn three Omnath. Like, whoa. Whoa. And then turn four, like, you play a Fable Passage. You, I don't even know. Maybe you go Escape to the Wilds. Maybe you go, like, you just go off. It's wild. It's so crazy. And that costs you two freaking cards. And you're already playing them in your Omnath list. You guys are magical Christmas land over there with Clover into <laughs> Omnath. You still have a Beanstalk Giant. You know, and you have a Fae. You know, like, wait, Jesus. Wait. First, the Giant. Let's say let's say this scenario happens to the Timo Clover list and to the Omnath list. The Omnath Clover list actually has Giant as well. So you have two additional answers to the Omnath there without just clover into giant right and you also have bone crushers so like realistically you can you can off that cobra and it, if if, <laughs> if the cobra gets 
You play half sort of spell, by the way. I've been convinced. I've been convinced. Like, on, but honestly, if you're listening to the podcast, I'm shaking my head right now. Honestly, though, the key to beating Omnath is do not let them untap with a Cobra on turn three. I'm serious. Like, whatever deck you're playing with, because that's the that's the card that makes the whole deck go. If they're if they're not doing anything with Cobras, then it feels like okay. I'm fine with that. <laughs> yeah, I will say this about the four color Omnath deck, though. I did like the Giants, um, the Giant Killers. Uh, sorry, not the Giants. The Giant Killers were a nice addition. Um, and one of the other things that Seth talked about earlier about the spike field hazard, is that what the land is called? Uh, um, yeah, the, the land that does one damage, that's something that I've never been able to jam into my adventures list. I think I, I really want to, I mean, it kills, like you were saying, it kills, it kills, uh, Cobra, it kills, uh, other innkeepers. And also it, it can combine with a stomp to off a crab, which is like, Honestly, not nothing. Like the freaking crab is the bane of my existence at this point. Um, so I, I'd definitely like to see that card in there. Other than that, though, take your white and go. <laughs> two days in two days in Discord, Jason will write Clover Omnif is the best deck in standard right now. <laughs> oh my god, we're gonna have to, we're gonna have to get some side bets going for these for these podcasts so that uh, I don't know. Seth has more to win than just his like scoreboard. Ding. Number three. <laughs> oh, I, I've already got. Don't worry, you're not the only person that's 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 down on the Manfield scoreboard. I've got I've got a lot of other people that, <laughs> that have big old goose eggs, and I've got a lot of tally marks. All nice, nice. Well, <laughs> so, I came up with them name Planeswalk with diary. He has a diary. I told him, yeah, Jason. <laughs> who? <laughs> Jason, what's that? Oh, you don't think Omnath is a good card? All right, zero. <laughs> Hey, hey, I was right about mono red, though I guess no one disagreed with me with me about that one. You're just like saying in Grokey's chat. I wasn't brave enough. Yeah. So yeah, I wanted to say, uh, is there any deck you guys looking forward to test next? I mean, since there are definitely angles to tackle the Omnath list. Um, like I tried Grixis today, also on request. Um, I think I want to explore Crocs a little bit more now. If it seems like there's definitely a lot of possible. Uh, a lot of uh, mill decks around. Also, Hazard is a good card. There are just many good cards in black and red as well. I really do like it. Yeah, I think Kroki's broke it already with his uh, Grixis Kroxa deck. So what else is new? Another day. Mm. <laughs> uh, Another day of the Scottish life. <laughs> yeah, do you guys like... Say a little bit more. Have you guys... like? I just saw the list. It looked, it looked cool. It looked like it counteracted a lot of what people were trying to do in the format in regards to like mill and stuff. But do, do you guys think the deck's actually like busted, or or what's the deal? So I think he was basically saying so. There's this, this Demir control deck in the format that's been yeah. pretty popular, and I think that that is the way you combat Omnath because, as we've already talked about it, there's no Uro, right? Uro's gone. There's four Omnaths. There's, you know, a, a whatever, a, a, maybe six other win cons in the deck. There's not that many win cons yeah. total. So you just go. Counter spell, counter spell, counter spell. You don't have any more good cards in your deck. You just ha you're playing a deck with half lands and some mana acceleration. Two thirds of your deck is just complete air. Yeah. Right. So like, if you're playing a deck where you just sit there with a million counter spells, you just go, all right, I'm going to play thirty counter spells and thirty lands and like some shark typhoons or whatever. You just go counter, 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 and okay. <laughs> like like it's just it's just classic control where if you don't get anything in play or get get a good card to resolve then you're not gonna be playing much magic so that's kind of and without uro now which was kind of the way to that was the way you break bro broke through these counter spell decks is you had you just could re reoccur and play uro again and again you no longer have that so i think that is the biggest problem with the uh, on that deck right now and that's the way that's the reason why control decks are you know can exploit that and you can definitely build a control deck to beat on that i guarantee you that now the problem is once you add all of these counter spells how are you beating the other decks that are not that, that actually are attacking right mm -hmm. and those decks we may start to see more of them as the format starts to evolve and you know, all of a sudden, red decks are back, and Gruel is back, and 
it's like, all right, I'm sitting here with my rewinds and my, you know, and my, my Ashiox erasures or like whatever it might be. But, but, and, and I have to answer like three creatures on board and I'm, I don't, and I don't have sweepers in my deck because I'm a Demir deck. Right. So mm -hmm. that's kind of, I think the idea behind the Grixis deck is you get to play your counter spells, but you also have the red removal spells. Like you get bone crusher giant, you get, you get additional removal so that now you can kind of pivot into either deck. Like if you're against Omnath, you go counter spell heavy. If you're against creature decks, you get to have access to a lot of more removal. <laughs> yeah. I also want to mention like the hardest matchup for counter decks in general used to be uh Timo Clover. First, you have the Eddie. If you don't have an, uh, the Innkeeper, if you have no answer to the Innkeeper, your one-on-one -on -one trades are bad. Then there's Clover. If there's a Clover on board and they cast something, what do you want to counter? They always get value. And now we just have Angriff, Rampage, and Bedevil just rotating out. So the best two answers to the Clover are gone. Um, if Clover gets popular, I don't think Grix can stand. But if Omneth, Omneth is still tier zero, Grixis is good. So we really have to see how this rotation happens now, like Jason men mentioned before. And yeah. But I like the deck. I like the idea of Croxa in a Grixis list and a Demon list. Yeah. So, real interesting points there. Um, I played a bunch of the blue black Demir control deck before the Uro ban. I found it to be quite good. Um, I was even beating uh, Rogues, which I thought would be a tough matchup, you know, classic control, slow control deck versus a more like, uh, you know, tempo style deck, which typically goes towards the tempo style, but I was actually able to control them, kill their creatures that were important, counter what they were doing uh, quite well. Um, I also found the Omnath matchup to be decent, if not particularly favorable. And then I've also found that um, Teamer Adventures has actually struggled with some of these decks packed full of counter spells, which I found shocking because for all the reasons Danny listed, Typically, um, you know, like back in Team Adventures heyday when Blue White Control was the best deck, it would just eat it for breakfast. It was like almost like a hundred percent win percentage for Team Adventures. It just always beat Blue White Control. Um, something about these Demir control lists is a little bit different, though. They they actually have removal for Innkeeper, which is a big one that Danny touched on there. Uh, before the Blue White decks had to play like Shadow the Sky, and their ECD couldn't touch um, Clover or Innkeeper. So they struggled with those two cards a lot more. Whereas now, the Demir list, um, it's able to kill Innkeeper, no problem. And then something about having a Clover in play, whenever, like, so I'll be playing against uh, Demir, and I'll land a Clover, and I'll, I'll be like, okay, that's almost game. That's like, I'm going to generate so much value now that they won't be able to keep up. But I don't know if it's maybe yeah. like some of the cards in like the cyborg that you can wish for aren't quite as strong or your threats aren't quite as strong. For some reason, I'm never able to like snowball that advantage. I think you're right. I think you're right about the innkeeper. The reason why, like one of the reasons why Clover decks used to be so good in, in their heyday was getting that card advantage off the innkeeper. And now innkeeper is just kind of, it's just another card in the deck. Like it's almost like, well, I'm an adventures deck. So yeah, I'm going to play it. But like, it's also just such a vulnerable card because it gets it got it gets all of the splash damage that like it very rarely um, like there's it's basically every removal spell that you can think of gets rid of it. It's it's basically like everyone wants to kill Lotus Cobra, so they're also now going to be able to kill your innkeepers, and so it's actually hard to get the card advantage if you don't have a turn two clover and like you're not going to have it every game, and then if you do have it. You still also need a couple other things to line up. Like you may need a beanstalk giant. You may need. It depends on it depends on the matchup. And now there's also going to be people that hopefully, and I've seen this already, people just are cramming wilts into their deck because they're like, well, if they if I stop the innkeeper, which is easy, and then I just like if I stop clover and innkeeper, it's like okay, n now what are you doing? Like like now you're on the escape the wilds thing, which I think that escape the wilds is is a really important card to the deck because without it, I just don't think it would have enough card advantage to function. But um, so, yeah, I like, I've been seeing a lot of games come down to, can you, can you cast escape through wilds at the right time? Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, you know, if the control deck is on the play, they now have like, they're running the gates. 
and they're running the new land that's like a force spike that both counter a clover on two um and then if you don't have clover on two or maybe you're on the play but maybe you you know maybe your land comes to play tapped or something on the second turn if you're not able to get the clover in under their counter spells right at the beginning of the game like the the deck's just packed full of counters and it's actually hard to get it into play later on the four spike is one of the most interesting cards because as a control player i hate it like i hate playing with it because it, it's like okay i draw it late game and it's always like it's always a do nothing it's always a land but I don't think about how it impacts the other player, right? And from the perspective of a Clover player, it's like, well, I have two mana up, and you know that I'm playing the Force Spike. It's like, well, you don't want to wait until turn three, because if you wait, all of a sudden you're so off curve, and it, Clover's at its best on turn two. You really need it early to be able to have your, your best draws. And so it could just be the... Like, Either the threat of the four spike makes you play it on turn three, which I think is it's probably wrong, because then all of a sudden you could run into neutralize, you could run into other things. So I think you're normally jamming on two, but it's like one of those cards that just having it in the deck is going to make you think twice uh, about your plays. Yeah, there are also other lands that are actually really good. The the Black Mythic land in a, in a format where Mill is uh, around can definitely uh, have a high impact now and in rogues I, I pulled it off multiple times where you just pay six and you get like a, a one mana a two mana and a three mana and you suddenly have a full board again so there it's really nice i wonder if there are other strategies uh, will use that land just for this reason and the red one seems also really good it's a removal spell as well and yeah, yeah the black one that returns creatures from the graveyard has been sneakily one of the better cards um in this new set um, in Zendikar, especially even as you go out, I know we've been talking entirely about standard, but I've also been testing historic and like in any type of black, because there's more black aggressive decks in historic, you see them more like the black red aggro, mono black, like it's almost just a free land. It's like I'm I'm playing, say I'm playing Sultai, and now my opponent has just like added four of these to their black deck, or they like it's almost just like a, a freebie. Whereas now they've got more things I have to worry about. So it's like one of the more powerful cards, and especially like right now, I guess I don't know what other uh, mainstream black aggro decks there are besides rogues in standard. But I think we will see more of them, and we will see this card a lot more because there's not that many. Like right now in the format, there's not that many straight up aggressive decks. If mono red becomes popular, or maybe gruel or these ember cleave decks become popular, now all of a sudden you're thinking a little bit about playing lands like these because the life becomes relevant. But at this point, with Omnath and Clover and stuff like the three life, it's like okay, whatever, I'll pay three and and I'll move on. The game's not really about that. Yeah. So um, I love that we're bringing up the uh, what are they called? The the land spells. They have like a good name flip something okay I guess. well the, the the flip card land cards that nailed it um so yeah really interesting they are very so one i love them they're amazing uh i wish we had them like in every set even practically like they just you know they smooth things out they smooth the game out in a really nice way that doesn't feel like uh it smooths it too much it's just like i don't know it just hits it just the right amount um but one thing i wanted to bring up with you guys is uh, when you're building decks or when you pick up a deck, how to sideboard with these cards. Because I am totally lost. Like I said, I like to get those uh, the land that deals one damage into my team or adventures list, but I have no idea like, do I take out spells? Do I take out lands? And like the mana requirements are kind of hard on the deck, so I didn't know what to do there. And then also when I pick up a list that has these decks in it and I go to sideboard, I'm like, can I sideboard these cards out or now do I not have enough lands to play? So, like, how do you guys like uh, look at them, and how do you how do you figure this stuff out? It's weird. I don't think there's like an exact number of these spell lands that you should be playing. Like, I know that I've heard questions of like, how many is too many, right? Because we've seen, I've seen decks play up to tw like twenty, maybe. Like, like there's been gr green decks where you can play the you can play a bunch of them. There's the there's the seven mana one, the turn timber, unta the untapped one that you can start, you can put a creature from your library into play. 
There's the mana dork for two, the the floor hedron. There's the three three landfall. There's the there's the fight, which is the three mana one instant. There's even the the one that returns um, a card from your graveyard, and I, th I think there might be another one too. So um, there's a lot of them that that are out there, and that's just in green, right? That's just like. If you're playing mono green aggro, all of those cards actually deserve some consideration for your deck. And I think that you have to think about it from the perspective of if you're playing too many of these cards, then you get you do get to a point where you have too many tap lands because most of them come into play tapped. The untapped one the untapped ones I think are a little bit better gen like generally i think we're seeing them played a little bit more just because um especially in decks that also have maybe another tap land or they're more aggressively focused that having a land that comes into play tapped is is kind of unfortunate but as far as deck building yeah it's it's hard to know whether to count them as straight up a land i i tend to count them as i've been counting them as three quarters of a land in my deck building because theoretically the more of these you have if you count them as three quarters of a land it's like okay technically i'm playing too many lands than i normally would but at the same time it's going to mean that i'm mana screwed less like that's how it should come out because you're playing too many lands but these lands can also function as spells right so i'm actually i'm i'm playing both more lands and more spells than i normally would which means that i'm more likely to have a draw that is functional now it might not be as powerful as a deck that because maybe maybe a bunch of these lands come into play tapped if i'm playing a lot of them etc but it will at least be a functional functional draw um if you play more of these and you just count them you know as three quarters of a land etc but yeah i mean sometimes i will sideboard them out i think it's some sometimes it's play draw dependent also like on the draw, I'm more. I'm just more likely to to want to cut a land or two, especially one that comes into play tap because I just have that one extra card, which which matters a little bit. And then sometimes it'll just be cut be because yeah, like if I'm on the draw, the four spike is worse or whatever, so I'm gonna cut it on the draw. Yeah, for me, it's I I usually play them more on control list because it's really crucial to make your land drops in control. So and the blue ones they're really nice, and the black ones tends to be nice as well. I think it's just dangerous in like in the mono green deck must be really tricky to build because you want to curve out right, and you have too many tap lands there. It's going to be really hard. So I, I think Ben Stark made a post about it, and he said you should first look at the the spell side and second at the land side. And then build your deck and not not just replace them you cannot run on one replacement and uh, replace them so i think seth's approach with uh three three quarters is, is actually really good um i wonder yeah it's it's a really tough deck building decision but i also look to spell first and if i really think that fits then i can build around it all right so this has been a great episode i think we want to talk about now just kind of where the podcast is going we all three of us i think not only want you all to be able to listen to the podcast but we also want to directly help you become better players and so the way we're doing that is through our patreon okay um but we're not just asking you to sign up and whatever whatever no we're doing it a little bit differently we've got um, a number of ways to help you improve whether it be direct matches i think some of us are actually just going to be playing matches against um, our team members We've got our deck doctor. We've got our weekly video calls where we're talking about how to help you improve. So we're really trying to not only make this about us, but also make it about all of our Patreon team members. So we want to just say thank you to that uh, at Planeswalker Pod on Discord. And Danny, do you want to talk about our team tier, which is our highest tier? Yeah, we have the team tier, that's the Plains Walker tier, where we do the weekly meeting. We just had one yesterday. It was a blast. It's nice to meet everyone in person. Again, thank you for joining. I really enjoyed it and, and hear about every story. It's it's really nice, especially during these times, to, to meet new people and become a team and try to go forward. So I want to talk shortly about our Plains Walker. 
in our Discord. And I will start with Foxy here. Thanks a lot for everything you do. And yeah, uh, Jason will talk about this later. Um, Incognito, Matt Salaryman, Oppo, Plato, Puppet Master 26, Variously, Smash Jacks, Tim Frank, Jerry, Carlo, Lucy, Naval Smart, OCD. Um, thanks a lot. Really appreciate all the support. And I'm already looking forward to next week to talk to you guys. Yeah, totally. I Man, I've been having a blast. Uh, the community that we're building is absolutely fantastic. Just a bunch of like-minded, fun-loving people. You know, everyone's just there to learn, help one another, uh, improve at magic. <clears throat> we, um, you know, like the guy said, we have weekly calls. Uh, we're posting decks. We're critiquing decks. We're critiquing plays. Uh, we're keeping each other informed of uh, all the tournaments that are that are going on. Uh, we're even playing some other games. We had some Among Us going with like I think there were ten of us playing. Um, it's it's really a blast. And so um, as another way to give back to our community, um, we're going to hold two five hundred dollar tournaments uh, free to enter for all of our patrons. We're going to be doing um, we're going to stream them on Seth's channel on Twitch. We're going to be hosting. Uh, so the first one is going to be on October the 17th. This is a Saturday. I will say that currently there's nothing scheduled from Channel Fireball or Wizards of the Coast. So we're kind of thinking that maybe something might be coming from Wizards. So this could get pushed to the Sunday potentially if a big tournament comes up and everyone wants to play in that instead. But if not, then it's going to be on seven, uh, the 17th of October. So this is the weekend before the Zendikar Championship Qualifier. Um, we're going to try and get everyone, uh, you know, some good tournament experience, some testing, because we want, you know, everyone that's trying to qualify for like rivals and MPL for the Zendikar championship. Uh, we want them to do their best in the qualifier. And then the next one will be on November the 1st. So this is on a Sunday. Again, this is going to be bef the, the weekend before the next championship qualifier, which is on November the 7th. So again, these are $500 free roll tournaments. Everyone that's in our Patreon will be uh, allowed to enter. We'll be live streaming them. We'll be doing commentary. Uh, this is just another way for you know us to give back to the community, uh, both um, financially, but also as a great way to practice for these championship qualifiers that are coming up. So I'm really excited uh, to put these on. Big thank you to the Patreon, by the way, uh, for helping us host these tournaments. This was the um, one of our patrons actually came to us, wanted to be able to help the podcast and the community out more. There were not a lot of tournaments to play in. And they're like, hey, you know what? I'll throw down some money um, and you guys can host one of these tournaments and everybody wins. So that's the kind of community we have. Uh, I can't say thank you enough how much it really means to us. Uh, and I'm really just excited to just get back in there and, and keep doing work, you know? Yeah, I've been really impressed. I just want to say thank you to everyone. Uh, it's The support has been really overwhelming. And it's been also, I think, the three of us, it makes us want to make, give back as much as we can, dedicate as much time to this as we can, because uh, we think we have something special here. And just want to say thank you all to listening. This is only our second episode. So we know uh, we're already we're already scheduling tournaments, $500 tournaments. It's like what? So yeah, we've got uh, big things to come. All right. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's just impressive. I'm speechless, as everyone knows. Well, shall we say goodbye? Yep, I guess that awkward sign off number two episode two. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, everybody. See you guys next Bye. week. Bye.